Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's a little bit after two, so I think we will get started and we'll just continue to um, let people in from the waiting room as they show up on this gorgeous Sunday afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'm Sarah Linda Lichtblau, Director of Education at the Hudson River Museum, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's program, Cultivating Enchantment, Photographs of Secret Gardens. Garden landscapes, the combined product of human imagination and nature's possibilities, have the power to transport us to places we may never have known existed. In his 2020 book, Garden Portraits, Experiences of Natural Beauty, photographer Larry Letterman, who has completed six books on landscape photography, including several devoted to the New York Botanical Garden and one on Olana, explores 16 varied and romantic examples. Gregory Lawn, President Emeritus of the New York Botanical Garden, called his photographs visual tone poems inspired by places he has come to love. Today, we join Larry Letterman and Laura Vogels, Chair of the Hudson River Museum's Curatorial Department, for a virtual look at these natural fantasies and for a discussion of how landscape art is reflected in the aesthetics of gardens, both private and public, and their connection to the themes explored in the landscape art and virtual travel highlights from the collections of the Hudson River Museum and Art Bridges, whom we thank for their support of today's program. A note, please, that your microphones have been muted upon entry, though you can control your video camera. You can also use the live transcript closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen provided uh, by Zoom through AI. Should you have any questions, comments, or concerns, we encourage you to type them in the chat throughout the course of the conversation. And now it is my honor to tell you a little bit about today's guest, Larry Letterman. In 2020, the Monticelli Press published Larry Letterman's Garden Portraits, Experiences of Natural Beauty, with over 200 color plates featuring 16 public and private gardens in New York and Connecticut. This is his sixth book in the past eight years, following Frederick Church's Olana, published by Rizzoli in 2018. Letterman dedicated 10 years to following Church's footsteps with a camera around America before photographing his Hudson home and landscape. In 2019, the book received the Victorian Society in America Book Award for its photography. The Rockefeller Family Gardens, an American legacy, covered the three gardens in New York and Maine. In 2012, Monticelli published Magnificent Trees of the New York Botanical Garden with Larry Letterman, and in 2015, published Interior Landmarks, Treasures of New York, which featured his architectural photographs. Mr. Letterman's extensive photography of the New York Botanical Garden was also featured in Abram's 125th anniversary edition of New York Botanical Garden. Letterman's work is held by numerous corporate and private collectors and is currently on display at the New York Botanical Garden, Wave Hill, Montefiore Hospital, New York Law School, the New York School of Design, the New York Landmarks Commission offices, the Pocantico Conference Center at Kaikut, the former Rockefeller family home in Tarrytown, New York, and as part of the Evelyn Lauder Collection at Sloan Kettering Hospital. His work also hangs at Winter Tour and was used in their most recent guide to the museum. Letterman received the Art of Travel Award from Departures Magazine. Town and Country September 2019 magazine displayed six of his photographs of the Dave Brubeck Home and Garden, which is part of, natural, of Garden Portraits Experiences of Natural Beauty. Letterman's work was most recently exhibited in celebrating the New York Botanical Garden 125 years at the Ross Gallery there. He is also shown at the New York School of Interior Design, the Lehman College Art Gallery, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the Rockefeller Brothers offices all in New York City, and at Olana in Hudson, New York. His work appeared frequently at the Four Seasons Restaurant in New York Seagram's building, and was selected as the final show at the restaurant's closing. And now I am happy to turn the program over to my colleague, Laura Vukels, Chair of the Curatorial Department, 
who will begin by showing us some of the images that inspired today's conversation with Larry Letterman. Laura. Thanks, Sarah Linda. I think we've probably gone through the first few slides here. Usually we just have a slide that talks about uh, who's gonna, well, why don't we go back just for a moment uh, to let people know who's here today besides me, you know, Sarah Linda, my esteemed colleague, who's assistant director of the education department was just talking to you and Olivia Cipriano, our manager of programs and operations is uh, running this slideshow and taking care of like literally everything else. Uh, Sarah Linda already pointed out all these details about the Zoom presentations, except I don't know if you said that after the Larry's program that I'm going to moderate questions and comments that people have been putting in the chat during, or maybe want to wait and pose afterwards. Next slide, please. So as Sarah Linda mentioned, um, the impetus for this program came from the fact that we have this wonderful exhibition up right now, Landscape Art and Virtual Travel, highlights from the collections of the HRM and Art Bridges. And it is generously uh, funded by Art Bridges. These programs are funded by Art Bridges, which is a foundation founded by Alice Walton and connected with Crystal Bridges Muse Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. And in this photograph uh, of the uh, beginning iteration of the uh, exhibition, uh, you can see a, this very large uh, painting by David Hockney of the Grand Canyon in the center of the display. And so we were, I'm, I'm not gonna give you a whole tour of this exhibit by any means, but just by way of introduction, when we were first thinking about this exhibition, which the Art Bridges Partnership uh, was developed to enhance collection galleries. So we will borrow a few things from Art Bridges and combine them in a theme with our own collections. And so um, we decided to focus on landscape this time. We were actually planning it before the pandemic started. And then once the pandemic started, it even seemed more relevant to us the power that art has to bring you to a place when none of us could travel, none of us could go places. And that was one thing that really um, made us very interested in, in Larry's photography too, is that, you know, he has traveled to all these amazing gardens and through his photography, we can also visit these gardens. And one of the things that we really looked at when we were talking about this theme and that we researched more once the pandemic had started was the fact that there have actually been scientific studies that viewing, being in nature can benefit you, your um, mental and physical health. So it does not surprise me at all to learn that Larry's photographs are hanging at Sloan Kettering because there are also studies that show that even if you experience nature through art, whether it's paintings or photographs, there are also uh, healthful benefits for you from experiencing nature, even if you're experiencing it vicariously. Next slide, please. So the main artwork that interested Larry when he came to visit us at the museum and we went in the show was this piece by Cynthia Daniel called Light Atlas from 2016. And even though there are 360 paintings in this, it is considered one artwork. And in this artwork, uh, Cynthia Daniel was inspired uh, or rather she was inspired in terms of the call to action by the fact that she could think of a lot of male um, landscape artists, particularly in the 19th century who had traveled around painting the United States and she could not name a single woman who had done that. And so she set out for her a task to draw a path around the, to circumnavigate basically the, the, the perimeter of the 48 states that are on the you know the the continental U.S. and stop every she she divided it up into 360 degrees because it was roughly a circle and stopped every 27 miles to paint a painting I mean she didn't paint them all on the spot but she documented and sketched them and she went back to her studio and she created all these paintings so that and we, I, we talked to, and you can I just have some details if you want to keep going Olivia. Um, so here are some details. They're very small. They're only about as big as a piece of paper. You can keep going. 
And when you're standing in the whole thing and when you get to the end, I have a view of the entire, almost the entirety of it, uh, you really get a sense of sort of a swath of the United States, which is in some ways, as Larry pointed out, almost the opposite of his approaches, which is to go to one spot and just study it and study it and study it again and again and again. Um, but what's true of both their art is that, um, you know, they uh, both help bring you to another spot. You feel transported to another place by looking at both of um, Larry's art and Cynthia's art. And I'm just going to turn it over to him to tell you more about that. Let me get, let me see if I can get my, uh, here. Okay, we're up on the screen. So I assume that you all can see what I have before you. This is the cover of the book. Larry, we're still uh, missing the PowerPoint. You, um, you, you share the, screen? You don't have the screen? Button. Yeah, so, can you share, hit share screen at the bottom of the toolbar? Oh, hold on a minute. I have to, let me just uh, press the screen. Yeah, all right, uh, share screen, okay, there we go. All right, now we can do it, right? Um, and did a window pop up? Yeah, okay, so- okay, There you go, perfect. Okay, perfect. and then, okay. Now, now I guess we're all on, right? Is that, that looks good to yep. me, yeah. Okay. okay, this is the okay. cover of the book. And uh, <clears throat> the cover will appear later, um, and you'll see uh, it, it, where it fits in in the scheme of these presentations. There are basically 16 gardens that I followed for at least uh, a year, many gardens for uh, three or four years, some five or six, my own garden for 20 years. So my approach is basically uh, to a, see a garden and, and document a garden and photograph a garden over at least a year. And if I can, I usually begin in the winter so that I have a sense of how it sort of performs, see its bones, and then uh, get to see it as, it as it develops over time. Um, this is the first slide. Uh, this is a, uh, a cypress, a bald cypress bog, uh, which is in the Hudson Valley. It was created by a man who has a, uh, a landscape of approximately 1,200 acres, and he wanted to mimic or imitate uh, the Appalachian Trail. And so he has plantings uh, in the southern part of the property from Georgia and the northern part of the property all the way through to Maine. Uh, this bog uh, can weather over. These trees are in fact deciduous, and uh, I have an example of them um, in the fall, which we'll come to. This is the same in the fall, and uh, you can see it's it's a it's um, it's quite brilliant in its aspect, and and the conceit is uh, that he's created a garden which is all native. So uh, he has to weed it and keep it from uh, it being interfered with by uh, common plants, which are no law, which are not really native, uh, but uh, everyone has in their gardens. So his garden is not immune from other people's gardens. Uh, the photography is meant to capture the beauty of it and to give you a sense of place. Uh, and so uh, when I choose one spot, I often will come back and catch it again in other light and in other seasons and so forth, which is very, very different from what Cynthia does. She circled the United States. I basically have a small sphere and it's all, in this book, it's all within 20, 25 minutes of my home. So I could get there when they were, when people would call me and say, it's gorgeous today. And I would come and run and see it. <clears throat> uh, this is Ann Bass's garden. It's in uh, Connecticut. 
And it is basically a farm. And this garden has 1,200 acres as well. She has cattle on the farm and she has gardens here. Uh, <clears throat> I present this as the opening slide here to give you a sense of its architectural uh, and also agrarian nature. <clears throat> so the fencing gives you the sense of the farm and the distance gives you a sense of how far it is and the, and the rock in the foreground I'll let you know uh, that uh, this is natural as can be. This then is her herbal garden. And um, it's a square, but I photographed it on the edge, on the corner, uh, to give a sense of the diagonal. And in the back, you can see a water feature. Uh, that is a 19th century fres French cider press. And the water gets filled as the seasons change. This is early in the spring. And as the season changes, uh, there are uh, plants, water plants in there. <clears throat> so this garden is caught at a moment in time before it is really flush and full, but it gives you a feel for it. Um, in, in the book, um, there's much more presentation, but I'm just giving you a glimpse of what's there and, and how elegant and beautifully it's presented. This is a detail of that garden. Um, the garden has espalier pears, and you can see a pear. Uh, the uh, stand for it is a metal work, which was designed just for the garden. And the pear stands alone, I'm told by Ann Bass, because uh, the deer eat them. So it's hard to get to them uh, before she can get to them. She was surprised that I was able to get to them. We're going to another garden now. This is the beckoning path. And this garden is the garden that's on the cover page of the book. And I'd like you to see if you recognize it because it is pretty much the same spot that's on the cover, but it's completely different. The cover is foggy and this shows the light. The man who made this garden is a man by the name of Nirenberg. Nirenberg was the owner of and the chief designer at Dansk. So he built a garden, which is really an oasis garden. It, there's an eight acre pond and the garden is built around the edges of the pond. And you walk around the pond to see the garden. And what you get is a sense of light from both directions, depending on where the sun is and it changes all that. As it would do all gardens, but this one, you get the reflections as well. So here is the cover page showing the same shot in fog. And you can see that the feature in the center, I'll go back for a minute. You can see it there, it's man-made. He built that out to catch the light because he was creating, in fact, works of art. He was creating something which is equivalent to a canvas. Um, he photographed it as well. He was a very good photographer. He had a book published uh, and uh, <clears throat> I, I met him uh, years ago. Uh, he's, he's gone now. The garden is passed to someone else's hands who is keeping it up, which is a rarity. One of the things about gardens is, uh, as lovely as they may be, they often don't last the owner. This is another view in that garden. And it's a very complex photograph because it's reflective of the sky so that the two thirds up from the bottom, the white you see is not snow. That, that, those are the clouds. They're being reflected uh, in the water. And the blue you see is the sky, which is the water. If you look up in the left-hand corner, up on the left-hand corner, you'll see the trees inverted uh, in, 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 the, in the photograph. And in the right-hand corner, you'll, you'll see inverted trees. In the left-hand corner, you'll see a ground. That's the, that's the base ground 
I always try to include a ground in any photograph I have, or if it's of a tree, it's base. We move on to a Dave Brubeck's garden. Um, the photograph is taken in such a way that you have a path in. The path leads you to uh, the gate, which is a very unusual gate. It's a symbol of the rising sun. It tells you that this is a Japanese oriented garden. It's quite unique gate. I have never seen anything like it. And the, uh, the mass of trees on the right are Japanese maples, and it's, give, it's trying to give you a sense of the color of it and uh, as if they were brush strokes. We enter the garden now. Here you are in the garden. This, he, held, he built this with the help of his father, by the way, the, the, the uh, lake area, the water feature. There was water running through, but they expanded it and dug out a leg. Uh, this is a retreat for Brubeck. He composed here. He had an electric a piano in there, and he had five kids who were all taking music lessons. So he had to get out of the house from time to time. And this is where he worked. It's quite a lovely retreat. Uh, it's an island, and the bridge you see connects you to the main area. This is a view from Brubeck's house. On the left, you see uh, the manicured end of the property. And on the right, you see uh, the woodland aspect of the property, the yin and the yang. The water flow leads you into it, and you get a sense of its depth. Uh, the house is, was all windows on this side, so you could clearly look out and see it. And I took the photograph from about the second floor up uh, on the deck. We're now in a, another garden. This is Lewis Coleman's garden. Lewis was the uh, vice chair of the New York Botanical Garden, and he's also on the board of MoMA. And um, he actually initiated for the garden, uh, the events that they have now, uh, when MoMA closed down uh, for repairs, Lewis had all the, had the he convinced the, the, the museum to move all the sculpture, the outdoor sculpture to the New York Botanical Garden. And the garden had its first outdoor show. It was such a big success that they started to uh, have shows thereafter. They have a wonderful show now, and you should look it up on, the, on its website. It's fabulous. Anyway, this gives you an entire view of Lewis's garden. It's a very small garden. There is a water feature, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the bulbs here, the tulips, are, are when, when they die, he, he brings in geraniums. So he keeps the, the, the flower color going all, all summer into, into the fall. This is the water feature, which was an old quarry. And it's, I normally don't uh, take photographs of swimming pools, but this is brilliantly done. You can see the steps in. And the conifers were, were a collection that Lewis uh, loved, and he would clip the hedges himself. He died about a year ago, he was over 100. He lived a full life and enjoyed his garden. The garden is in the hands of his grandchildren. This is the garden of Arnie Glimpshire, who runs Pace Gallery. And the garden is really an outdoor gallery. And I took this, this is of a work of a Chinese artist. And I took the picture because it's a fun piece. I took it oh, sort of bending down as low as I could get to give the sense that the figure is swimming. So to get the sort of joy of it. Um, this is part of that garden. The garden is in Long Island. It's the only one that's really not within the uh, area of either Connecticut or Westchester. 
and uh, I and it borders a, a pond, Georgia Capon, uh, which is a wetland, and um, I caught uh, the heron uh, to give you a sense that the garden, any garden, no matter what, is subject to nature. This is a Greenwich garden. It's owned by uh, a, a man who, uh, who runs uh, Rogers and Gothigan, which is a, a fabric maker. He has a real acute sense of detail and has an eye. And he had originally a very, very formal garden. And he, it was too formal for him. So he brought in a designer, Debbie Nevins, who sort of softened the edges and you see the grasses here. And so you have a combination of the formal and the informal here, and it plays its way through the garden. Uh, this is below that area. You can see the hedge. If you look at the hedge up in the upper left-hand corner and other hedges uh, where we just looked, but it sort of runs down a slope. And uh, he has an orchard here and a, a meadow. So he, the garden goes from formality to informality to a meadow. This garden is my garden. It's called the Hawk's Nest. My wife's name is Kitty Hawks. And so we call it her nest. She actually designs the garden and I photograph it. That's our relationship. Although she said, how does this look? And I'll say, no, no. And I get some say, basically a veto. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't choose the things. She gives me an array of things to choose from. The uh, tree on the right here fell down in, uh, uh, in August in, in the hurricane. It was over 100 years old, over 100 foot high, and it toppled uh, root ball and all, which was an extraordinary thing to see. And so its destiny was determined by the fact that it was on a rock ledge. So it could last all those years, but if a storm came at a time when it was in full leaf, it was very precarious for it. And after 100 years, something like that came, and it was in full leaf and it fell. We've We've sort of had to build the area up because you can't plant anything that was all edge. And we've put in a magnolia now. Our property has water running through it. And this is a sense of the water area in the fall. Uh, this is the lowest point you know, on a, on, in the property. Uh, you can see it, there was an old, it was an old uh, a reservoir and uh, that was the sluice house, which let the water in. Uh, but it's quite a, a lovely little uh, a building. OK, uh, this is where the water enters the property. And uh, so this is in the fall. The water comes from the sort of the left-hand corner. And there's a lake above us. And it flows through under the road and into our property and then down into the old reservoir. Uh, I have photographed this garden uh, as long as I've been photographing, which is now 20 years and I keep track of it that way. We're at a new garden here. This is Innisfree, which is a public garden. It's one of the few public gardens on our list which, so you can visit it. And uh, it was a private garden. And ultimately, it was, it, it was put in trust and is in public hands. It's a wonderful garden. The photograph is taken in such a way from below to give you a sense of, uh, of, of the depth of the wall and uh, the rock available there. And the wall, all the walls in this free are different. So uh, they all have names. And they all have different kinds of workmanship. They're quite beautiful. This is Innisfree from above. 
to give you a sense of its place. And it's called a cup garden. And all the little guys, the garden in the upper uh, half of the uh, photograph is a completely different garden from the garden where the stone lining sort of divides it. Uh, and you go from different garden to different garden. It's sort of based on a, a Chinese scroll. It's brilliantly designed and it's got all kinds of features. Um, we are now in uh, the garden of the Steinharts and uh, the Steinharts have the large, one of the largest maple collections, uh, Japanese maple collections in the United States. There are approximately 1400 varieties and he has on his property about uh, a thousand. This is sort of an entryway into the garden. I chose this because there's an apple orchard here. If you look through, you see the orchard. If you follow the line of the road, you get to uh, the conifer collection uh, to the right. If you follow the line of the road to the left, you get to the maple collection, which is up and above uh, the hill here. This gives you a sense of the uh, maple and the Japanese bridge sort of uh, sets a sense of place. The maple spans the bridge. Uh, every time I went into the garden, I would take photographs of it. And I have it in all seasons in all different ways, but it's just, it's just it, your eye just is drawn to it. Uh, this is part of the maple collection. And you can see it's a woodland kind of a presentation. Uh, the water is ever present and runs through the property. Uh, this gives you a sense of the depth of the collection and uh, the different varieties. And the, 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 there's a path through, you can see that, and that is a path through for your eyes as well. It gives you a sense of the depth of the photograph. I always try to get something which leads you to around the photograph or into the photograph when I, when I photograph. This is still the Steinhardt collection. There's water above and uh, this was built uh, recently in the last year or two. It's a lovely uh, water feature and uh, it, uh, the water flows to the edge and uh, dr drops down, uh, goes into the ground and comes out in the lake below. Uh, there's a path to the right so you can get to the top and there's a rill and the water follows a rill from its source. This is the Japanese garden at Kaikit, which was uh, John D. Rockefeller's garden. The garden was originally built in 1909 and the Rockefellers had a real interest in uh, in uh, Asia, and uh, they set out when they started building their garden to have a Japanese garden. It's relatively small, but quite brilliant. It's for their property because their property was, you know, thousands of acres. Uh, it was, and they've given a lot of it away. I think the perimeter now is about 350 acres. At Kaikit, this garden is two acres but it's a walled garden. It has a, a hill on the, on the back end and on the left-hand side, there's a wall that follows around. And it's, you walk into it by walking into, through two hedges. So it's never present in your mind. You cannot see it until you enter into it. And when you enter into it, you're in a different world. Nelson Rockefeller, uh, revitalized it in the 1960s uh, with his sister. And um, it's quite, quite brilliant. It renders, uh, it's, re it's a, a rendering of a garden in Kyoto, but I'll talk about that. So it has a contemplation garden uh, where you have stones and raked sand. And we're, we're looking at it through one of the maple trees, which, it's, this garden is glorious in two seasons. It's glorious in the spring because it has azaleas 
and the azaleas are rich in color and the flowerings are gorgeous. And then in the fall, the maples are thrilling. You get these brilliant oranges uh, and reds and it's impossible to breathe practically at the beauty of it. Uh, this is a maple at the entryway. And it, as you walk in through the, through the hedges, you cannot see anything other than the maple, which spreads itself out. And then as you walk down steps, everything starts to be revealed. If you look in the right-hand mid area there, you'll see lines that look like they're straight lines. Those are stalks of bamboo. You walk through a bamboo area, and if there's a wind, the, the bamboo whistles. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous pleasure. I've sort of been besotted by this garden, and I did a book on the Rockefeller Gardens, and I included the Japanese garden there as well. Okay, we are now in uh, Ed Marin's garden. Marin was an antiquities dealer, and he, uh, but he had a real taste for gardening. And this is the entrance. It's hard to believe it's so complex uh, in terms of its presentation and all the things that are there. Those are the toadstools of cement, but they've been there for years, so they have all that moss on it. And the zigzag leads you to the house. You can, if you look through, you can barely see a roof the house, and the house overlooks the pond. This is the pond area, and there is a, uh, a brilliant uh, glass uh, cantilever out. Uh, Ed liked the, he loved the, the trees, so he liked to look uh, at the trees from the treetops, and this gave him that opportunity as well. Uh, this is uh, a, um, a Japanese uh, garden, a water garden, and uh, it is heated. It's not connected to the lake on the other side. If you look in the mid there, you'll see a sort of a land area uh, between the, uh, between the uh, green area, and that is the lake on the other side. But this area is totally sheltered, and there's a Japanese-like bridge which you can walk on and walk through, and you get a sense of walking in, in, the, uh, in the lotuses and the lotus paths. This garden is called River Hills. And the, you're, you're presented with an illusion here. The illusion is that the apple tree runs all the way across the frame. It doesn't, there is basic, basically, it sort of meets the shrub uh, there, but I caught it in such a way as to give that sense of illusion. Uh, this garden, uh, what I, I, I did this garden for about a year, and when I came there, it was very, very bare, and uh, I got the most pleasure from this garden because it's beautifully planted. And so I was always surprised during the year at how lush it was with the plantings. Of course, when you start out in the winter, uh, it looked like a, a bare field. This is the same area walking down, and you can see uh, that it's completely planted with uh, different flowers and so forth. And it gives you a sense of, of the seasons. I love this. This is an outdoor eating area, and I normally don't photograph outdoor eating areas, but I have another one which we'll see. Uh, but what I love here is that it's constructed. Uh, these are uh, London plane trees and she's constructed this garden from uh, the trees themselves. And you sit out and you're in our, uh, the garden area where, which is like a meadow, small meadow planted with flowers. This garden is the garden of Henriette Basur, and it's called Rocky Hills. 
she was a, a very important designer uh, for Bergdorf and other uh, department stores. She sort of created the whole uh, method of selling furniture by, by creating rooms. And she would uh, create a, a, a sense of space and so forth where you could buy the furniture, which is now being followed all over. But she was a leader in that. And this is her garden. Her garden is interesting considering uh, that what she did for a living. And her husband was a uh, worked for the Frick and he restored old masters. So they were two people with enormous senses of color. And so you get all this color here, which you don't get really in the rooms that she had. And she's a plants person. If she could find a plant, she planted in her garden. It's about 13 acres in the garden. Here it is again. Uh, that is a sequoia in the center. And these are, you can see the, the, the plantings here, the flowers, they're just gorgeous. It's, it's alive in the spring, wonderful. Uh, when I met her, she was about 95. And uh, I fell in love with her and I fell in love with the garden. There's an outdoor area there, the platform. When I would come, I would always make sure I had my lunch and I would take my lunch out while I was going to be photographing so I could look at the garden and sit there on, on, the, on the benches and just look over at the water and, and what, was, what was now blooming. We're now in a completely different garden. This is called AP Farms. And um, this is the winter. Uh, but I love this shot because that's a barn. Uh, it's, and there's a, so you can see a snow path and it has a Wyeth quality to it. Um, and that, that meadow is a five or six acre meadow and it changes all year. There are a couple of meadows on the property. It's a 40 acre uh, parcel. This is the same garden. Uh, those are viburnum in the back. They're just lush. So you can see how it goes from the winter to this green, lush greenness. And um, you can see the power of nature in this garden. It's, it's just, and they have, there's a formal feature right in the right, left hand corner, you can see the hedge. But other than that, it's bursting. And the formal feature leads to a horizontal a flower garden. We're now in the last of the gardens here, which is good timing. Uh, this is a Fred Landman's garden, and uh, it's in it's in uh, in Connecticut, in Greenwich. Uh, Sleepy Cat Farm, it's called. This is a wisteria hedge, and the bench is looking at a labyrinth. So when you sit on the bench, you're, you, you can enjoy the wisteria, and then you can contemplate the, the labyrinth. Very sweet. A very complex garden. It's the one of the few really formal gardens, and you'll get a sense of it. Here, uh, you can see uh, that's a reflecting pool in the back. Uh, this is the labyrinth with a um, sundial in it. The, 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 the way I took the photograph leads with a diagonal. So it gives you a sense of the depth of it. This is a serpentine hedge. And the hedge is deciduous. And I love it because it, it allows you to see the garden as it's beginning. Uh, we don't often see that. And what you see here is uh, you see 
The magnolias in the back, just starting, the white magnolias are the first to come. And you can see how winter is still there. And things have not moved in that hedge. We'll come to it, we'll see it, and you'll see that it becomes something completely different. Now, I argue with my publisher about this. She said we don't, she didn't like the idea that it was not uh, all green and so forth. And I said, gardens aren't all green. We have to have something in there to show what they are. Got to show the bones. Well, I thought that's the last of it then. We are now uh, finished with it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer any questions that you have. I think we finished on time, Laura. Yes, definitely. And I actually do have a few questions for you if no one else does, but I encourage anyone else to put their questions in the chat. Um, I was really struck thinking about these wonderful photographs by a few things. Um, one is the idea that gardens, uh, the, the connection of gardens to nature, because I was mentioning it before about how nature is beneficial to us to be out in nature. But a garden um, is a curated version of nature. And like paintings, they can bring nature closer to us, which is important, especially in cities. We didn't really talk about city gardens today, but I've heard you talk about city gardens before. So um, I was just curious, do you have anything to say about your own experience spending so much time in nature and in gardens? Well, uh, look, I, I, I regard them as works of art. So when I go to a garden, it's, it's art. And as I define a garden, it's basically, it's a portal to nature, but it's the individual's portal. The design is portal. The, the family's portal. And then immediately as it becomes a portal to nature and it's a design space, it becomes a stand against nature's intrusion. There's an irony there in that if you don't keep weeding it, it'll just go to seed and you won't have anything. Don't um, we all know it. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes an enormous amount of upkeep. But if it's love, and you can tell when a garden is love uh, because it sparkles and it, it, it delights. And if it delights, it never goes to sea. Well, I, I am interested in the fact that you've done a lot of photography at the New York Botanical Garden um, because being in a city, I think, especially in New York City, for such a long time, dating back to the 19th century, they realized how important it was to create gardens for people to be able to experience nature if they lived in tenements, if they lived in apartment buildings, you know, in the city. And I know that, I don't know this about the Trevors who had their estate at, you know, where the Hudson River Museum is now, but certainly some estates would have days where they would let people come in and see their gardens. Well, they, you have that here. Uh, the Garden Conservancy has open days and a lot of people uh, open their gardens for a couple of days and there's a, there's a big calendar of it. and You can go and see people's gardens. I grew up, by the way, in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, I didn't see a garden until I would get to a local park or something like that. Uh, and even then they weren't gardens. But um, the Brooklyn Botanical Garden was in fact a refuge for me as a boy, as was the library. Uh, but I love the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And that as an adult, I wound up doing legal work, I'm a lawyer, uh, for the New York Botanical Garden and wound up on the board. Uh, and that's how I started actually doing my photography because I would go there on the weekends in the mornings just to see the garden and be with the garden. And I love the trees. And so I started photographing. So it's something to, so that the photography is, didn't come first. The photography came second. The art 
the art just basically surprised me. The beauty just drew me in. And ultimately I wanted to express what I was feeling and what I was seeing, which is uh, a delight. And, and then what happened was people said, God, the photographs are interesting. Well, you're being too modest because I've heard you speak before and in a different context for a different audience, you spoke about your cameras and your lenses and tripods and the fact that you're always thinking about what's in every camera, a, a corner of the composition. Right. So in case any photographers are on the listening right now, I didn't know if you had anything to say about that. Okay, that's, uh, Laura, I appreciate your, uh, your, your turning to that. Um, well, uh, th this is the, uh, the thing about photography, which most people don't quite get when they start, is that um, position is point of view. So people walk into a space, they look at something, it catches their eye, and they take it. And that's that, and they say, been there, done that. Well, that's one point of view. If you just turn around, use your feet, uh, you wind up with different points of view. And so one of the things that I do, which is very different uh, from most people is I really get involved in the garden and I wanna know it for at least a year. And I wanna, I, I walk it before I photograph it. I get to know it, to see it. And then uh, I have destinations. I wanna see things in, and then, uh, then when you create a photograph, it's a frame. You have to decide what's in the frame, what's not in the frame. The artist can put in the frame anything they want. The photographer cannot. So uh, the only thing you can do is move and you can keep moving and moving and moving. The lens will change the frame to some degree. A wide angle lens will give you a larger frame and therefore wide angle lenses are hard to use because you have to really fill the frame and you have to fill the frame in such a way as that there's an object, there's a focus, focal point and there's movement in the frame. Uh, well, I noticed in a lot of your images, you were using a long depth of field where a lot of the, a lot of the length of the panorama is in focus, but I mean, do you use a shallow depth of field for that kind of blurry effect a lot to focus on certain elements? Well, no, I don't, but what I do is this, I get the same effect. If I'm shooting flowers, for example, I'll come in on them. And uh, even if I have a long <clears throat> depth of field, the depth of field is for short because I focused on one thing. And so everything sort of becomes soft uh, around it. So I don't try to get um, a kind of glow or anything like that. I try to keep the space, the space, uh, but you, but if, if I'm focusing you on something, it becomes the sole focus and everything else becomes soft focus. I mean, one thing that really interested me about the whole idea of your book is, is that you become a curator of these gardens, because just like when someone comes into the museum and I give them a tour, I'm focusing their attention on certain things. And you go into a garden, and as you pointed out, some of these are many acres. So by the very definition, by you taking your photographs, you're telling someone where to focus their attention. It's, it's really interesting. It's like, it's like your photographs become a tour. Well, the other thing- is your viewpoint. Yes, no, uh, they're actually my viewpoint. And what happens is, <clears throat> Gregory Long points it out in the introduction to the book, that uh, I've taken pictures at the New York Botanical Garden, and they'll ask, where is that in the garden? <laughs> and I say, it's right outside your window. Uh, yeah. Because what I've done is, if you flatten the plane using a long lens, you can, you can move things around. Uh, you can have a sense, there is in fact, you know, a, a space that you can fill and unfill depending on how you stand and how you focus. So you create an image, which is not quite what people see. Exactly. Um, I mean, I know we only have a few minutes left and a few people are on the call, but I welcome for anybody else to ask a question. I don't want to hog all the questions. Um, it was such a beautiful presentation and it makes me want to go visit some of these gardens, the ones at least that are open to the public. The ones that are open to the public, let me repeat. 
and it's free, is open to the public. Um, the Kaikit is open to the public. <laughs> and um, what else? Well, many other others that weren't in your presentation today that you have photographed in the past are open to the public yes, for sure. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm just gonna jump in and, and remind everybody about New York Botanical Garden with the incredible um, Yayo Kusama show that's on view now. Um, and the curators there, the gardeners there have curated in the conservancy gardens that um, reflect uh, Kusama's motifs and colors, which are in incredible. They're pretty extraordinary. So I can't- Wonderful show. Enough. Yeah, beautiful show. Beautiful. Um, Larry, there, there's one thing I wanted to ask, Laura, if you don't mind my jumping in. I, I welcome it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I couldn't help but think about Monet's gardens at Giverny and think yes. about, you know, the way that Frederick Church basically sculpted his um, his property to render landscapes that he would that he wanted to paint. Right. Um, you know, the I see so much of what you're doing as, you know, sort of in that vein. And I wonder, you know, how much that's in your thoughts as you're photographing. Well, what's interesting is this, you know, if you take uh, Monet or something like, uh, he would paint haystacks and he would paint the same objects over and over and over again in all different lights and so forth. Uh, I do the same thing. Um, they, they, there's an inherent beauty in them and they change with the weather, they change with the season. They change with the day, they change with the light. And uh, the gardens themselves uh, have a, their own environment in a way. They, they're a mini environment. So uh, the, uh, the, when I was talking about the Rockefeller a Japanese garden, for example, it's over a hundred years old now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has, so it's, I believe it's no longer a replica of anything. It is itself what it is because it, it grows here uh, it's it's not really uh, treated uh, as a Japanese garden, although they try. Uh, but you you can't be you have to be in the culture to be able to do it. So I I think it's sort of escaped in a way, and it's more beautiful because of that. It it sort of got past the rigors of its initial uh, conception, and now it expresses itself in in ways uh, that we could not imagine. So it's art, and it's yeah. keeping. And I, I love to capture that. We do have one uh, a person watching who I happen to know who says this was a beautiful presentation and it did indeed lift her spirits. Oh, sweet. So that's, that's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely. I, um, I think all of us during this uh, very difficult year of 2020 and into 2021 have been thinking a lot about our relationship to being outdoors and to nature. And um, it, it's just interesting to me how it has caused us to focus a little more on considering these relationships. Well, I think that the, what, what's happened is that there has been a big increase in, in interest in gardening. You can't get plants now. Uh, <laughs> my wife orders, you, you know, from all, all those kinds of nurseries and so forth, and they're back ordered, they're backlogged. Uh, there are so many more people buying these things uh, and uh, people are just buying books too uh, because they just wanna see what other gardens look like. So it's, it, there's a, a, a renaissance going on here. Well, people that might not ordinarily be outdoor people are realizing the benefits of being outdoors. <laughs> yeah. It's lovely out there. You know, true and, and safer, right? As you know, well, you know, I mean, what happened was I was, uh, you know, basically I, I was a city person for years, and uh, uh, and, and the botanical garden I think saved me in a way uh, because I would go there, uh, uh, hectic schedules and so forth, but on, on Saturdays and Sundays in the morning, I would go there and just walk around, and uh, and they, they would people would get to see me and they said, after a while, they said, you know, you know this garden better than we do. 
I, well, I said, you want to spend more time in the garden. <laughs> yeah, I, I was listening to a pro, another program that you gave and uh, your advice was really to get out there and do the work and use your feet. You said your feet were the most valuable asset to the photographer or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well Laura, thank you so much for um, for your questions um, to Larry. And um, you, I did Laura. want to mention that that Catherine, who has since um, had to leave, said um, she thanked you um, and really enjoyed your presentation. Um, Larry or or Laura, any any last thoughts? I, I be, you know I think we're gonna everybody who was here today is gonna use their feet to go explore those public gardens um now that the world is reopening it really has come at a at a, a wonderful point in time where we can actually go out and and take a, a a look possibly with renewed spirit and from another perspective thanks to your um thanks to this presentation larry well i was just going to add that the museum is in a park trevor park mm -hmm. in yonkers which has been very busy during the pandemic and it's the it's the former estate of the trevors which has some original trees unfortunately not any other original plantings and then we have our courtyard i was walking yep. through there the other day and a visitor was sitting in one of our outdoor chairs and and said this is worth the price of membership just to sit here and enjoy the 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 sunshine and the you know the green grass and blue sky in the courtyard yeah yeah. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Laura. Thank you very much. I think this is just for inviting me and for uh, being so helpful here. It's it's been wonderful, um, and I I appreciate having a chance to present my work. Well, thank you very much, and thank you everyone. And and go out and enjoy the rest of the beautiful day. And take a look in the chat. I put some upcoming programs that were also inspired by landscape art and virtual travel. One with the artist James McElhenney uh, coming up on the 19th and then one with our teaching artist in residence, Julia Santos Solomon on the 22nd. Again, thank you, Laura, Olivia and Larry, most of all for being with us today and sharing your vision um, with, with our audiences and with us. Thank you. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much.